morning and welcome. It's good to have you here. It's nice to be here. And there's even a few unfamiliar faces, which is even better. It just may mean that I know you, but I forgot who you were. That's possible. But it's really good. Now, if you're visiting with us or new with us or haven't been for a while, delightful to have you here. And we'll try most of what you need is in the Green Prayer Book, and today most of the music is in the bulletin. And just follow along with everybody else, and it'll be fine. So thanks to Bob for doing the music today. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. O oh, come, let us worship. Our opening hymn in the bulletin, we have come into this house. We have come into this house to gather in this name to worship Him. We have come into this house to gather in this name to worship Him. We have come into this house and gather in this name to worship Christ. Read, mark, learn, and be 
first reading is from the book of Haggai, the first chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month. In the second year of Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Jerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasure of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our song for today is in the bulletin, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. The Lord is righteous in all his and the loving in all his The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all those who love him, but he destroys <laughs> all the wicked. My righteous shall seek the grace of the Lord, and all the flesh bless his only name forever. not to be quickly shaken in mind or land, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one who destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring to be God. Do not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you. Comfort your heart 
hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. The word of the Lord. Thanks. You'll find the words for the gradual hymn in the bulletin, Blessed Be the Name. We stand and sing together and remain standing for the gospel reading of Paul. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glorious of my God and King, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that turns our fears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. in the story about the bush, 
where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I only see one small and medium-sized person, so I'm thinking Hathir to come up the front night and put her on the spot, but I also see Cynthia. So Cynthia and Willow and Norma between them can figure out Willow, I think that would be great. But thank you. I don't think I'll bring her up to the front because one kid doesn't work out. <laughs> Sunday school these days has ten kids one week and one kid another week and then five kids alone. Confusing. In any case, let us pray. Lord, I speak to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I think this is one of those weeks when whoever does the reading really ought to get some sort of prize for having worked their way through, through, well, Darius is easy, but then you get Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and so on, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. They were not very nice to us back in those days. I, what name can we choose? I suppose nowadays we just have funny spellings of names. That, uh, in any case, this comes from a time in the life of the people of Israel, of God's people, they had been taken away into exile in Babylon, and much of what they had left behind had been destroyed. Darius, the Persians take over for the, for the Babylonians, and they didn't. They let them come back, encouraged them to come back, and and rebuild, kind of as a vassal state. I won't go into all the details because you know, I'll get them wrong, and they don't matter as much anyway. Here's my point. The people returned, and the place was kind of a mess. It was a disaster. They returned, and, and everything had been torn down. And selective memory kicks in for a lot of them. They remembered Jerusalem and the temple as this wonderful place, the most beautiful place in the whole world. And, and when they looked at this pile of rubble, it was hard for them to know what to do with that. Because clearly, what they remembered, or what they thought they remembered, or what they heard about, wasn't the reality. And when they got there, they got squeezed. And I want to talk a little bit about what happened there. They really believed, and, and thank God for that, because if they hadn't, we probably wouldn't be here. They really believed that God would not abandon them, that God had not abandoned them, and that God was returning with them to the land that God had promised them. They also knew the place was kind of dumb, at least when they got there. And that it was nothing like what they had hoped for, nothing like what they had anticipated. So they had the reality that they saw in front of them, and they had their faith and their hope and their belief and the two crashed into each other. And we see that in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that in Haggai, we see that in a number of places in the Old Testament from this period of time. And what happens is their faith starts to focus not on the bricks and mortar, not on the realities of the nation, of the land, the physical land, but their faith starts to look more to beyond the heavens and the earth. And their faith starts to focus a little more on what happens afterwards, after we die. And you see that the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land so the treasure of all nations will come and I will fill this house with splendor and this wonderful image but increasingly, though, know, that's not what it's going to look like. And so they start to focus more on, on the heavens, on, on the life after life on this earth. In the earlier part of the life of the people of Israel, 
They didn't spend a lot of time worrying about what happened to people after they died. But it starts to become more focused, partly when they realize that, well, it wasn't going to be that great here. And, and that's, so that's, now I want you to hold that thought, because it's going to come back around a little later in the sermon. At least that's the plan. I love cooking shows. I don't watch food TV as much as I used to, in part because I'm busier, in part because it's mostly weird contests. Right, you know, here you go, we will give you a piece of liver, we will give you some lemongrass, and you have to make a dessert, or whatever. I'm only exaggerating a little bit if you ever watch those crazy things. And I don't find that that interesting. But I really do enjoy seeing someone who knows their way around the kitchen explain <coughs> the finer points of spices and, and why you should do a thing in a particular way, and, and why they do it that way. Why you use a heavy pan for this, a light... I like that stuff. But I have to tell you, when I'm really hungry, I don't really care that much about what amount of which herb is required, or the backstory that you get about someone's grandmother's farm and owls with the goats or whatever. And nowadays, you have to go through what, eight pages before you get to the recipe, because they have to explain, my grandmother used to do this, and she taught me that. I'm hungry. Mostly, if I'm really hungry, which doesn't happen that often, to be honest with you. I really, I just want something I can sink my teeth into, something that can deal with my hunger. Now, after I've eaten, I can sit down and watch TV, and oh yes, there would have been a little margarine, would have been helpful there, or I could see the little cumin in right at the end. Would be not when I'm hungry. I don't care about that stuff. When I'm hungry, I want food. As you can tell, say I don't get hungry often enough, probably. <laughs> but some questions shouldn't really be asked unless we really want to know the answer. Because if we don't really need to know the answer to the question, we're not going to hear it, no matter how correct or how cleverly or how carefully it's stated. In the Gospel reading, the Sadducees, those who don't believe in the resurrection, it says, they approach Jesus, they don't really want an answer. They want to play theological tennis with him. They heard this guy's pretty smart. They heard he's kind of clever. Let me try this out. I don't know if you ever watch, you know, uh, news conferences. There was, who's the guy who works for Fox News? Peter Ducey or something. He's always trying to catch them. The little gotcha questions, right? It's kind of, they're giving Jesus a gotcha question. And they're trying to set him up so he looks silly. And that's really what they want. They wanted to play. But they didn't really want to answer. Now, I love discussion about things and academic debate almost as much <coughs> as I enjoy a good meal. But it's not helpful if someone is really starving for an answer. If they really need to know the answer to that question, they don't, they don't need the subtleties. <coughs> the Gospel is not about marriage. It's, about, it's a question about resurrection. And Jesus, to be honest with you, almost seems to be having a bit of a flat day in his answer. But that's partly because he knows they're really not, they don't really care. They want to debate. They, they want to have some fun. They want to fill some time. They don't really care what happens. Other people in the various Gospels get better answers to the resurrection. But that's because they were asking the question with a lot more feeling and a lot more urgency. Martha is weeping for her brother, who is dead. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Mary weeps outside the tomb on Easter Sunday, and the answer comes in the form of her name spoken by the resurrected Lord. Ask the question with tears in your eyes. Ask it in a hospital or a nursing home. Ask it in those long hours of the night after some very tough piece of news has been received, we get a different answer. And we don't care usually at that point about the finer theological details. I remember reading an article that was posted about a month ago on a Canadian Anglican discussion site, and some fellow had written a very long, erudite explanation of why it was inappropriate to have eulogies at funerals and how really the people ought to understand the, the, the finer theological points. And it was just dreadful that these families felt they needed this. 
and myself and a number of other people said, I don't think that's the time to give people a lecture on theology. Mom died. I don't think that's when you want to prove that they're wrong. I think, I think that's accurate. Some people like them, some people don't like them. That's okay. But that's probably not a time to have a debate. They don't want to hear that. They're heartbroken. They want to know, what do we do? How do we do it? So the Sadducees don't really care what the answer is. Because it's not really something they... They just, they're having fun. So they're sitting there in their comfortable, secure, religious building where everything as far as they know is under control. And Jesus just says, no, it's not, that's not the point. He doesn't use those words, but that's basically what he says. See, the Sadducees come to, to Jesus and they already know what answer they're going to live with. There's nothing wrong with convictions. They've got convictions about it. But sometimes they can prevent us from seeing what's going on. Sadducees were very conservative theologically. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the ones that everyone thought Moses wrote. And nowhere in those five books is resurrection mentioned. They believed, so therefore, they didn't think the resurrection could be real. That was one of the things about them. Originalists, I think they call them in the States, in the Supreme Court. The second conviction that they came to Jesus was, and I don't know if they really believe this, but it certainly is the basis for their question. They came with the belief that if there is a heaven, if there is an eternity, if there is resurrection of some form, then it's going to be just like life now. Forever. And so they put together this peculiar, but I would call it marginally plausible story about a woman and seven brothers. You see, tucked away in the corner of Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, if you want to go home and look it up, is the idea, if a man died childless, his brothers <coughs> had a duty to create children with his widow so that she would have them to care for her in her old age. I'm not sure that was good or bad news for the widows. But nevertheless, that was the expectation. Now, there's no reason to think it was actually practiced in the time of Jesus. But what it allowed the Sadducees to do was set up a little trap, a little trick question that they could catch him. Maybe they even thought it was funny. Because it was a ludicrous situation. But as I say, marginally plausible. It was designed to show everyone who was listening to the question that this whole idea of resurrection is just Dumb. It, it would be crazy. Well, it doesn't strike Jesus as funny. And his response is to turn, turn the issue around. And he says to them, well, you're evaluating eternal life on the basis of our life now. And he tells them all those things that you're worried about, those relationships between people and marriage and all that stuff, they don't really matter afterwards. This is where Sir Hege and Zerubbabel and all those people come back in. Because some of the people who were returned from Babylon, from Persia, and found the place fallen to bits, were expecting what they thought they had before. And it wasn't going to happen. And so we see their faith kind of changing as they realize it's going to be different than we thought. Won't be worse. Might be better, but it'll be different. And that's kind of Jesus' Sense is that that it's going to be different than it is now. Well, I remember a, a cartoon a number of years ago of a fellow. You know, usually when we picture heaven, right, it's the guy with the wings on a cloud. You know, with a plane on his head. I remember seeing a cartoon of a, a guy sitting on a cloud looking really bored, and he goes, "I should have brought a magazine." <laughs> When we expect it to look like this, but forever. I don't know about you, I like my life. I like a lot of stuff that happens. I'm not sure I want to do this forever. I don't know, I can't speak for you guys, but it's different. So, in preparing for this sermon, I thought about a lot of the funerals I've conducted over the years. And I've been privileged to, to 
preside at the funerals of people from very young children to people well up in their 90s. Most of them have died from natural causes, but I've done funerals for a number of people who have died by accident or by their own hand. Some funerals have been intended by hundreds of people, some by only four or five. I managed to get my elbow on the national news one time at one funeral I did, but it had a fair amount of news coverage. Another one only had the funeral director and four or five other people who didn't really know the person. That one was kind of sad, I admit. But we know that death is going to happen. And we know that it's no respecter of age or status. And we know and I know that, that we often live as though it's never going to happen. Well, a couple of practical suggestions. Kind of changing gears here for a minute. And most of you probably know this. Most of you, hopefully some have already done this, but it, sign your organ donor card. Or whatever it is you have to do. I should remember this, but I think it's on your driver's license or your MCP card. Sign it. You don't need anything when you're done. And that's okay. If you're not comfortable with that, that's all right. But someone else might need it. And it'd be a shame if you didn't get it because you never got around to, to doing it. Get around to doing that stuff. And let the people around you know that you've done it. Because one of the things I do know at the hospital is when things are actually happening, they're going to talk to your family about what they're going to do. And, and make sure they know. That will make a difference. That will make it a lot easier for them, for starters. Along the same vein, have you talked to your doctor and to your family members about what heroic measures, if any, are to be taken in the event you're really seriously ill? I don't like to think about this. I don't suppose anybody likes to think about this. I have more conversations than I'd expected to with people about that kind of in the abstract. That's a deeply personal decision, obviously, but it's really not fair to leave it to your kids or your spouse or your doctor in the intensive care unit to make that decision without knowing what you would have wanted. Think about it. Talk about it. Make sure they know what you would like. They really will be glad if they ever need to, to, to make be around for those decisions. I don't like to think about that. Well, I don't want Bev or my kids or somebody to have to, I don't know, you never told me. I, I told you, but. If you have things that you want for your funeral, prearrange it, or at the very least, make sure somebody knows what you want. Too many times I've sat with families and they say, you know, there was that hymn Mama always said we should sing, but we can't remember what it was. You know, that's, that's sad. It doesn't have to be that way. Some people do the whole prearrangement thing and that's a choice, but or write it down or it's bigger, somebody knows. I guess at one level, it doesn't matter. You won't be there in any way to find out what's going on. But I think people will find it helpful to know that, no, she really wanted this hymn or that song, or to not have that in, or whatever. Have you got one more? Have you a will, and is it up to date? Or is your family going to get into a real mess? Because you hadn't wanted to think about things ahead of time, and, and, and it was a little ghoulish, and so you never got around to it. I mean, most of us, I think, have been through that at some point with some family member. It's way easier if it's already done. All right, those are, that's my simple practical list. And that, those are all important things, and I do mean that you really ought to do those as, as you're able. But there's more, too. I'm sure the Sadducees were convinced that, that their belief that there was no resurrection, their belief that all we have here is all we get, that put common sense on their side, and all that nonsense about resurrection they didn't have time for that. But we do. And God has promised us that it's not over. Now, over the centuries, you know, the church and people have sort of come up with images for what happens after we die and what that looks like. And they're just that. We don't, we have no idea, to be honest with you. You know, it draws on images from the court. You look at the paintings in the Middle Ages, they got all those little fat kids with the bows and arrows and stuff and, and all that. And apparently it's warm because nobody seems to have clothing on in those ones. But all we know is 
that God has promised us that his love will continue and that we will be in God's presence. We know that things will be different. We don't really know what they'll be like, but we know that it will be. And we know that God's love for us doesn't end when we do. Jesus says that, you know, we'll be like angels. Well, that begs the question, because what are they like? Again, you know, we have pictures of angels, but that's, they're not really based on anything in the Bible. They're kind of, I'm not sure to wing things. I mean, there's some descriptions of, well, I'll give you my lecture on Babylonian architecture and, and angels and iconography at some point, but I won't give it to you today. But there are some things that we do know. The first is that when we read through the Bible and we read through the stories and we think about our lives and the ending and what happens next, history has a direction. It doesn't just go around and around and around. There's a beginning and there's an ending. The words in the Bible are the theology and, and religion. They're not history. They're not science. But the message is plain throughout the Bible. There's a beginning, there's a present, there's an ending. The Bible has a plot. It begins with the garden with these people and then it's watered and God looks after it. Guess where it ends? Well, I'll spare you. You don't have to read the whole thing. It ends in the garden with being watered and, and everything's looked after. And all that part in the middle is God working to get us back in there. There's a goal. There's a purpose, and it has to do with God wanting us to be in the kind of relationships with Him and with each other that God has in mind. The Sadducees showed in their question that they wanted life to continue as close as possible to what they knew. We know that's probably not what it's going to look like, although I couldn't tell you that for sure. I know a lot of people, that's that old line, you can tell the Newfoundlanders when they get to heaven because they're the ones who want to go back home, I think. <laughs> might even be better. I don't know if that's possible, but it might even be. Whatever it's like, God waits for us. And whatever it's like, God will be there. And, and the love that we know in part in this life will know in full. And may the God of the living be praised now and always. Amen. In the prayer books on page 188, you'll find the words for the Nicene Creed. We stand together and affirm the faith we share. Let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and His Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
We move to our time of prayer. You may sit, stand, or kneel as you find most helpful. The intercessions today will be based on Litany 4, which can be found on 113 in the BAS, if you'd like to follow along. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear and have mercy. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for all who confess the name of Christ. We pray for the Salvation Army community here and in Mary's town, following the death of poor officer, Pastor Morris Collins. In the Worldwide Anglican Communion, we pray for the Church of England, and in the Diocese of Newfoundland and Labrador, for the Parish of St. Philip, the Rector, the Reverend Randy Lockyer, and the Parish of St. Thomas, the Rector, the Reverend Gail Coley MacDonald, and in our own congregation, we pray for our Bishop John, for Keith, our priest, and Sheila, our deacon. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear us. We pray for our connections with one another, that the relationships will be healthy and promote growth and safety. May our friendships and everyday work and social encounters reflect your care for us. We pray for those whose lives are bound in mutual love and for those who live in celibacy. Be their joy and their strength. Joy Lord, and Lord, we know we have responsibility <coughs> to do what we can to help. Thinking of your children who have no homes or live in risky situations. For all in danger, for those who are far from home, prisoners, exiles, victims of oppression from governments or personal relationships, grant them your salvation. Lord, Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who are facing trials and difficulties, the people affected in storms, particularly remembering those in western Newfoundland and the Maritimes, the people who are unemployed or underemployed, <coughs> for those who are sick or suffering, for Crystal, David, Jennifer, Dale, Alex, Lily, Pamela, Rhonda, John, Daphne, Peggy, Dorothy, Alfreda, Marilyn, and those who are dying, show them your kindness and mercy. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for one another, the learners and helpers, the friends and not yet friends, and the not likely to become friends, but still loved in Christ. For the people who are preparing for baptism and for confirmation, for Chloe, Nathan D, Nathan M, Peyton, Phoebe, Zachary, Michaela, Trista, and Sydney. May we always be united in service and love. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray to be forgiven the times we miss the mark of loving and generosity that you have demonstrated, and our other sins that prevent us from being all we can. Set us free from hardship, distress, want, injustice, and war. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we discover new and just ways of sharing the goods of the earth, making our voices heard and struggling against exploitation, greed, or lack of concern. May we all live by the abundance of your mercies and find joy together. Lord, hear us. We thank you for this time of worship and Eucharist. May we be strengthened by our communion with all Christ's saints. Lord, hear God, you lift up the lowly and heal the brokenhearted. You have pleasure in those who await your gracious favor. 
God, you have established peace on our borders and satisfied us with the finest wheat. You give snow like wool and scatter hoarfrost. You send forth your word, you blow with your wind and the waters flow. Hallelujah, how good it is to sing praises to our God. Amen. And we continue on page 191 in the Green Book. Page 191. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your saints' sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. To the extent you can, without breaking too many COVID rules, you can change the peace of one another. <laughs> the words for our offertory hymn are in the bulletin, if you need them. If you need him, touch him, he's not far away, for he's near you and loves you today. If you need him, call him as he passes by.
we pray together. Gracious God, your word to us is true indeed. Receive all we offer you this day, and let your loving kindness be our comfort. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. We'll be using Eucharistic prayer number two, which you can find beginning on page 196. Eucharistic prayer number two on page 196. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through our beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, He stretched out His hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so we won for you, a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread. Gave you thanks and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church, gathering to one all who share these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And on page 211, we use the form at the bottom. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Here is the first set of sentences on page 212. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And the Lord is good, and I dare pay the trust in him. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I see the God. And just that anyone present is welcome to receive the bread of wine with us today, if they would like. If you'd rather just have a blessing, you can keep your hands to your sides when you come forward.
You'll find the prayer after communion in the bulletin. We pray together, living God, in the Eucharist, fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us and bring us to the joy and promise. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And on page 214 in the middle of the page, glory to God, who is power working in us and in infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for a few moments for the announcements. We had a fairly light load of announcements this week, but it's just a deluge. But uh, lots of stuff going on, and, and I think a lot of it's good and interesting. So, first thing is the calendars are available. They're June, I think, will be at the back. And for $5, it's a pretty good. A whole year for $5, that's pretty good. That's about like a penny and a half a day. Not even quite a penny and a half a day. So, so we have some of them still available for $5. As far as I know, the Moose 2 tickets are it's a sellout, right? Yeah, so... You may have missed your chance. Stay tuned. We'll do it again sometime, probably in the spring. But but uh, it's going to be a good event. But if you didn't get your ticket, well, I'm, I apologize. Uh, let's see. There's an announcement at the back uh, for a dementia dementia friendly communities information center on November 16th at the Bill Davis Chalet. And there's three copies, so you can take one if you're interested. And, and so that, for, for many people, that becomes part of their life at some point. So probably a good session to attend if you have an opportunity. Parish Breakfast is coming up on November 19th. Put on by the men's group, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. It's a pretty good feed, so it should be a good time. Our parish, as we do most years, is assisting the, with the kettles for the food bank and the Salvation Army. And so we have agreed to look after November 28th, that's a Monday, and Tuesday, December 6th. We have a few spots filled already, but we have a number of, it's a two-hour shift. And as I think I said last week, if you're an extrovert, it's great. If you're an introvert, it's maybe a little harder work. But uh, I've noticed more people want to sign up for the liquor store than co-op or Walmart. <laughs> In any case, in any case, I think it's great fun, but as you can probably tell, I've been extroverted. But in any case, there's a sign-up list at the back and a list here, and if you're able to help out for a two-hour shift, that would be great. Um, it, 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 that, one of the things that we do in, in Clarenville, as they do in a number of communities, rather than all of the churches doing little bits for a food bank and emergency assistance, is we all help out in supporting the Salvation Army in the work they do. So that's where the, the food that we gather week by week goes, and, and that's why we all help out with their collection. ACW will have a tea coming on December 3rd, and I think there are some people floating around with tickets. Wave your hand if, you have, if you're an ACW person who has tickets to sell. Watch for the people with your hand waving, so they have tickets to sell. Except me. Final thing, I think, on the announcements are that our family, we had a family and youth event in October. It was great fun. And we had 38 people. That was pretty astonishing, I thought, for Halloween. We're trying again <coughs> on November 26th. Now, some of this is, and I realize looking around, we don't have a lot of youth here right today. But please pass it on if you have family members that you might be interested in or grandchildren or whatever. Um, so the idea is for parents and kids or grandparents and kids to come and, and, and get to know one another as well. So some of this, I realize November 26 is really hard to plan for the weather. But if the weather supports it, we're going to gather outside at Elizabeth Swan Park at the picnic shelter and have chili and cornbread and hot chocolate and, and if people bring cookies or desserts, we'll have cookies or desserts. And then at 7 o'clock we've got the bowling alley open for an hour. Now, if it's too cold, if it's miserable and like four degrees and miserable driving rain, you'll eat in the parish hall first. So that's kind of plan A and plan B. 
So, so um, youth and family, pass it around. We'll be chasing a few people as well. But and let me know if you think you're going to be able to come, just so we have a rough idea of what the numbers are. And I think that's all the announcements that I know of. Sheila is oh, oh we've got a couple more. There will be core practice on Thursday morning at 10.30. Thank you. And uh, we would love to have some new members. All right, thank Any you. Any of the new people, newcomers here who are interested in coming along and joining us, we would just love to have some. Thank you. So Friday, Thursday at 10.30 this week, choir practice for the following Sunday, and new people are welcome. And if, you, if you're skilled, that's great. If you're not skilled, it's also great. So you'd be very welcome. Thank you for that, too. And I, I, just to be clear, Sheila is not hiding somewhere. Sheila's over in Halifax visiting her son and, and grandson and, and daughter-in-law and so on over in Halifax. So she'll be back next week. At least that's the plan. I think that's it. So we'll stand for the blessing and then for the, uh, our final day. <coughs> May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is Mansion Over the Hilltop, the words of the Lord. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below.
Sunday.